afternoon, we have an opportunity of hearing from Ray Barrett. Uh, Ray is uh, a serial entrepreneur. He's done entrepreneurship like you can. When you hear the word serial, this is serial, like, you know, <laughs> repeated and continuously. Ray is also a sailor. He happens to be a pilot. I am excited to hear from him because as uh, one of my childhood dreams was to be a pilot. And please don't ask me how it ended up. But getting to know that uh, Ray is a pilot, it was an excitement. This is the closest I'm going to get to that, that profession. Ray is a business executive. Ray is a consultant. Ray is a mentor. And Ray has done this for over 30 years. In my language, we usually say three decades to just put it together for you to kind of comprehend what you have in the house. And he's been doing this with uh, helping people, directing and leading new ventures. I know many of us are on the call today trying to see how we can start ventures. He's done this in the United States. He's done it in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, all over Europe. And we say he's a serial entrepreneur. He has launched six companies. And he's done this from inception to scaling. I remember when many of you were in Synapse, we talked about sustainability and scaling businesses. So Ray has done that practically. Three of his companies have exceeded uh, more than $100 million in annual revenue. You heard me right. And as a consultant, Ray has spent a lot of time developing entrepreneurs and their teams to scale their businesses. And he just doesn't do that as some form of theory. He wants you to be able to scale your businesses for the glory of God. His experience is also coming with doing that in Africa where we are. And that it cannot get any closer. He's done that in Sub-Saharan Africa. Ray is a mentor, I told you. He mentors entrepreneurs. He helps us perfect our business models. And he's done this with um, the Kansas City Startup Village. Uh, currently, Ray is consulting with a Synapis group where he's helping in the area of building faith-driven redemptive businesses. So welcome with me, Ray. I hope you are feeling at Synapis and you are going to feel at home. Ray, over to you. Um, we would want to welcome you to speak to these entrepreneurs this afternoon. Well, thank you, Julie, very, very much. I mean, wh what can I say after an introduction like that? Um, <laughs> it's great to be with you all. Before we get started, I have one little thing I'd like to say, and that is in my group, and someone mentioned here in the, in, in the larger group about the, the difficulties and the constraints that everyone is experiencing. Um, Paul had a wonderful attitude about limitations and constraints. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says this. He says, now I take these constraints and limitations in stride and in good cheer. These limitations that cut me down to size, abuse and accidents, opposition and bad breaks, I just let Jesus take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. And I just want to encourage you with those words. Um, when I was asked to write uh, or, or to come and share with you uh, about leading uh, through the storm, I went and I put my notes on paper. And these notes are going to be in the Synapis blog, I think, pretty much after our time together today. And the reason I, I am encouraging you to go and read that is because I think you'll find a lot, I hope you'll find a lot of really good, uh, solid information, good principles that can help you steer your ship um, during difficult storms. Uh, we all need help now, we all need encouragement, we all need the power of the Holy Spirit, but we also need knowledge and skill set. Um, so I would encourage you to go and look at those notes. It's uh, 3,000 words. It's about seven pages. There's some good 
good little golden nuggets for you there. The reason I'm encouraging you to do that is because I'm not going to speak on that now. I've changed my mind. I'm going to tell you a story. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy this story and that it will have real meaning for you. Um, it's a true story. And I hope I have the permission to share my screen. Do I have that? Yes, I think I do. Yes. So if I can just sh share my screen right now, I'm going to tell you a true story of my experience crossing the ocean from London, England to my Miami, Florida. Yes, I am a sailor. Oh, and Julie, I have to tell you, I am a pilot and you want to be a pilot. Forget it. It's overrated. The last time I got into an airplane, I crashed the smithereens out of it. So don't, don't think about being a pilot. <laughs> Stick to the water. That's much safer. So uh, I want to tell you a story about my experience some, I guess, 18 years ago now. Above um, my little yacht called the Rebecca May. This is my sailboat. I'm assuming you can all see this now. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you see it? Great. Okay. Thank you, Julie. So this is the Rebecca May. And the Rebecca May is a 13 and a half meter, little tiny catamaran twin hulled sailing boat. There's her name, Rebecca May. Rebecca May happens to be named after my daughter, who just now finished her PhD from the University of Kansas City in uh, counseling psychology. She's a 13 and a half meter little boat. Uh, she's very strong, very seaworthy, and uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you a story about her. At, at this time, uh, you can see her sitting in her berth. Uh, she doesn't look like much. Here she is at sea, but she's quite a capable little boat. And at the time, I was living in London, England, and um, we wanted to take the Rebecca May from London, England, to Miami, Florida. Now this boat is very small. You can see she doesn't look like much. Here's her cockpit. It's not a very big, impressive cockpit. But if you notice something about her, if, you, if you're familiar with sailboat construction, you'll realize that, that the hardware on this boat is totally overbuilt. These wenches are twice the size of what a wench would normally be on a boat this size. These stanchions are made out of 216 stainless steel. They're heavy, they're weighted. This canopy can withstand 150 mile an hour winds. So there are little things about this boat that give you an indication that although she looks kind of ordinary, she's special. This stainless steel uh, bridge here on the back held up our dinghy nice and tight and secure. And this is my little barbecue where we cooked most of our food when we weren't throwing up because we were in a gale force storm. You can see the handholds around here, handholds all around the boat where you always had a hand, you know, always had a good solid grip so you wouldn't fall and wouldn't hurt yourself. The inside, here's the inside lounge, very simple. It's laid out to, to be a berth right now because when you're sailing and you're going through a storm, you need to have someone sleeping on that berth that can hear any problems that your watchman is keeping. You can see our little instruments. From these instruments, we could gauge how severe the, the weather would be. We could tell that the barometer was dropping or increasing. We have little oil lamps that in case of system failures, there's one on each side. We continue to have light. This is the navigation station, very fully equipped. We have flares at the ready in case we need a distress signal. And every single, every single cabin, every single area of the boat has a fire extinguisher. The galley is neat and tidy and secure. Here's ahead, the toilet. It works, what can I say? Toilet and shower. And here's one of the three cabins. There are three cabins just like this. The berth or the bed is a thwart ship, meaning it's running across the beam 
of the of the boat. And the reason I had that built like that is so that it would be more comfortable in a gale force wind. And I'm showing you this picture because this is a catamaran on the right, if you recall, a catamaran has two hulls. This picture on the left is a monohull sailboat. And that's gonna be important because I'm gonna talk to you about the experiences of a crew on a monohull sailboat that has one hull versus this catamaran, which has two hulls with a bridge that connects the two. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my, my screen. So that's a little bit about my boat. So we started out on a three-legged journey. The first leg was from London going straight south to the Canaries, which is on the west coast of Africa. It's 1,600 nautical miles. The second leg then was going to be from the Canary Islands going straight east across the Atlantic to land in Antigua. That was 2,600 nautical miles. And the third leg, we were gonna go from Antigua straight north to Miami, Florida. That's 1,200 nautical miles. It was almost 5,500 nautical miles the entire journey. And we're making this in a 13 and a half meter boat, a 40 foot boat, small. And here we were going on an incredible journey. Now my crew, I had an awesome crew. One of my crew was an experienced blue water cruiser a sailor with 20,000 miles of ocean sailing experience. The other, his name was Jock. He was my master, he was my teacher, he was my sailing mentor. He had sailed for over 35 years. He was a true salty sea dog mariner. And matter of fact, he had his master mariner's license and get this, Jock had over 1 million miles at sea. That is incredible depth of experience. And then of course, there was me, the master and commander of my little ship. I had 10 years of experience, 40,000 miles of blue water sailing underneath the keel. And we, know, we knew each other very, very well. We understood our weaknesses, we understood our strengths, and we had sailed hundreds of miles together. Matter of fact, Jock and I had sailed thousands of miles together. He took me all the way through my very first weekend um, of sailing school, all the way to the, to the point where I passed my Yacht Master um, Ocean exam and became a proper skipper. Uh, we, we, we really got to, 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 to know those uh, guys. And the, the miles that we sailed were all around Britain and all in the English Channel. And Britain and the English Channel is notorious for massive tidal ranges, for strong storm winds and rough seas. There's a saying in the sailing world that if you can sail around Britain, if you can sail comfortably in the English Channel, you can sail anywhere. Well, we were definitely the sail anywhere type of guys. We would absolutely be ready to go for any challenge. So our, on our first leg, we were crossing from London to the Canary Islands, 1600 nautical miles. And we had to cross over the Bay of Biscayne, which is off the French coast. And it can be very, very treacherous. Well, we had a little incident there. Our propeller got jammed. A commercial sailing vessel had lost its fishing net and that fishing net had wrapped around the propeller of our engine. And the propeller shaft was completely stuck. I, I tried to, to um, uh, alleviate it and, and, and to get it loose, I couldn't. I even dived into the water and man, the Bay of Biscayne is freezing cold. And I dived into the water, swam underneath the boat with my knife, trying to cut the net loose. I could not do it. Finally, after a couple of, uh, of attempts, I pulled myself up out of the boat, shivering cold with my lips turning blue. And I said, well, enough of this. So what we had to do is we sailed into um, Brest, which is um, off the coast of, of France. And it's a little fishing community. And Brest um, was very, very interesting town. It has a very, very low tide. and um, so we, we sailed into Brest 
And there was like a 25 foot tide. So we waited for six or seven hours and the tide went out and we were on wet, soggy mud, but there was no water. So we climbed down. There was this massive fish net around the propeller. It took us about 30 minutes to cut it loose. We finally cut it loose. We were there for several hours. We had a lovely dinner in the in a French pub, got back on the boat. And when the tide came in, we took out again. And there was a lesson that I learned that when you're at sea, you got to be prepared for anything and you got to be able to adapt to a new solution. Even if that solution means you got to divert your course and go somewhere else where you hadn't planned on going for a while. So that was a lesson that we learned. Our next stop as we were sailing down south to the Canaries was in Lagos in Portugal. It's in the Algarve region, the southernmost port of Portugal. And there we met uh, several other yachting couples and families who were sailing south to the Canaries to catch the trade winds, which would carry them all over to the Caribbean. So a strong southerly front moved in. That means there was strong winds coming from the south, a southerly front, the winds are from the south. And it was a huge storm and it battered Lagos for like five or six days. And it, it registered a force nine on the Beaufort scale. The Beaufort scale goes from force one to force 11. Force eight is a full blown uh, gale. Force 11 is a full blown kick you where it hurts hurricane. We were at a force nine. Now, all those single hull mono hulls, remember I showed you the picture of the mono hull. Those single hull guys, they couldn't do anything. They were totally harbor bound because they could not sail in such fierce winds. Matter of fact, there was a mono hull crew that thought they could cut through the storm and they set sail only to return about 10 or 11 hours later, totally battered, totally bruised and completely demasted. When they got out there, the, their mast of their boat cracked and then broke in two under the strain. They were very fortunate to make it back to harbor. The storm was pretty intense, but all of us guys had, a, on Rebecca May, we had a deadline. We had planes to catch, we had business to do. We couldn't be sitting around all day forever waiting for the storm to pass. So as a crew, we discussed and we debated the pros and cons, and we jointly decided to set sail into the storm. So lesson number two, you know, communicate openly, honestly, authentically with your crew, lay the cards out on the table and make a joint decision that which reflects everyone's commitment and buy-in. So all the remaining sailors in the, in the harbor, they were shocked when they heard we were leaving. They came to us, they said, Ray, Captain Ray, you can't go, you can't go. It's gonna be suicide. They couldn't go out into the storm. What makes us think that we could actually do it and that we would actually live to tell about it. Now we based on our decision to go on a couple of factors and I hope this speaks to you. First of all, the preparation and condition of Rebecca May. And secondly, the preparation experience and condition of the crew. So before I had commissioned Rebecca May to be built, I had specific design modifications made to make her more seaworthy. She's a class A ocean going vessel. You never know that by looking at her. You think she's a little bathtub, but she's not. And not every boat, not every yacht is equipped and made the way she is. So these are the design modifications that I put in. I reinforced her hull. I added additional buoyancy into the bow, and you'll understand soon why that's important. I installed those overbuilt and extra capacity winches so that during a storm, it's much easier to raise and lower the sails. I added additional storage, additional water supply, eight batteries with a windmill charging and solar charging device. I had a heavy duty autopilot and I had hurricane survival equipment installed. I had heavy, heavy duty safety equipment installed, an eight man ocean rated life raft installed and an ocean rated advanced first aid and trauma kit. And all of our systems had backup redundant systems. Matter of fact, it, this yacht was so well thought out that every system on Rebecca May could fail and we could still carry on and sail the ship. And we had food and water to last six weeks. 
Plus, we got fishing and diving gear. We were set to go. Secondly, we based the decision on the crew. Professionally trained, years of experience. As a crew, we had sailed together countless times. We knew our abilities, how each one reacted under pressure. I knew their strengths. I knew their weaknesses. And then we mapped out a plan. We reviewed and tested all of our equipment on board. We assigned a tight watch list for every crew member. So every crew member had four hours on watch and four hours off watch. So you didn't get too tired. We assigned specific crew duties that each crew member was totally responsible for. We left harbor in the force of a, in the face of a force uh, nine storm. And that wind was on the bow of the boat on the very front. And when the wind is blowing straight in your face, it means you are in for a rocky, rocky sail. So the winds were howling. One crew member would be on watch to look out for other ships, to look out for debris, to look out for floating canisters and, and containers. Um, the other crew would be resting in his bunk and the other crew would be in the little makeshift berth that you saw in the salon. The reason he had to sleep there was because with the rain and the wind howling so much, if the, if the, if the sailor on watch got in trouble, the other guy in the cabin would never ever hear his screams for help. It was only the guy that was about 15 feet from him in the cabin below in the salon, sleeping in the makeshift berth that would be able to hear him and save him. So we had 30 mile an hour winds. Now that doesn't sound like much. It's a stiff, very stiff breeze on land, but in the ocean, that is one severe gale, a force nine. We had 30, uh, I'm sorry, that's not right. We had 30 foot waves. We had about 45 mile an hour winds, 30 foot waves. These waves were just huge and massive. And as our boat would skirt up, we, we, would, we would sail up to the top of the wave. And when you got to the top of the wave, you could look out and you could see, oh, it was an incredible view. And then suddenly you reached the apex and you started to slide down like a roller coaster all the way down. And you would hit the bottom with a splash and the bow of that boat would dig in deep it, into the wave. And that's why we needed the extra buoyancy in the bow. Because when you come down that fast and you hit the water, the tendency, the water overtakes the boat and the boat flips over and it capsizes. But because I had added buoyancy put into the bow of the boat, when our bow hit that, hit the bottom of the wave, it immediately surfaced and sought fresh air. Amazing thing. We were down at the trough. 30 foot waves above us. And all of a sudden, I had a vision of Moses. I can relate to Moses as he stood there with his staff, stretching out his arms, seeing this huge pile of water just pile up, pile up, pile up, and the children of Israel walking on, on dry ground. Ground. We were, as we came down to the trough of that wave, we were surrounded by massive walls of water. It was thrilling, exciting, and it was incredibly scary. Seven days later, seven days, we were in this. 24 hours a day for seven days. Very little sleeping. We could just rest. Very little eating. Seven days. Seven days later, our little ship and our salty sea dog crew sailed into Gamora Harbor in the Canary Islands. That was an adventure. We were never so proud of our little ship. And we were never so proud of a crew as we were of each other. Matter of fact, the only accident we had was after our landing at Gamora, we went for a little celebration and 70 year old Jock, our master mariner, tripped on a mooring line uh, attached to another yacht. He fell over, he cut his head, he cut his nose, he had a little bleeding and he had one really black eye bruiser the next day. That's the only accident we had. I learned a lot about proper preparation during my sea days. And I learned a lot about teamwork and how through respect and authenticity and transparency, a team of two professionals who possess great, greater skills than I did, how we were all forged into a blow the hinges off the door performance-driven team. 
Sometimes entrepreneurs need to engage with the storm. Sometimes we just have no choice. We don't have an option to stay in safe harbor where we aren't moving. A company that isn't moving, if you aren't moving forward, you're moving backwards. There's no standing still. And you cannot afford, particularly if you are in an, if you are an early stage startup, to sit and not do anything. You have to grow. You have to move forward. You have to hit your KPIs or you are going broke. So your ability to survive, even thrive in a storm, I think is very similar to what we encountered on that little ship, Rebecca May. Your ability to survive is dependent on two things, on your, on your crew and on your ship. So the first thing I would say to you is, and I'm gonna draw on some material from Jim Collins here, do you have the right crew on your ship? Jim Collins would say, do you have the right people on your bus? So who have you hired? Who's your executive team? Who's your leadership team? Are they the right people? Do they have the skill set? And more importantly, do they have the aptitudes necessary to lead alongside of you? It's important that they have the right skill set and aptitudes. And aptitudes are those things that are a little nefarious. Sometimes they're hard to define. They're things like passion and grit and resilience. There are things like hard work. There are things like being able to pivot and turn on a dime. There are things like, like being able to handle ambiguity and being comfortable with ambiguity. They, they are very important aptitudes that we need. Aptitudes like collaboration, generosity, truthfulness, respect, openness, joy. So do you have the right crew on your ship? And are those crew playing to their strengths, not their weaknesses? Jim Collins would put it this way. Do you have the right people on the bus? And are those people sitting in the right seats? You know, you can have an A player, a guy who's just a high performing dude. He's an A player. He performs very well. But if you've got him stuck in the wrong seat, he will perform like a C player. Now a C player will never, ever, never, ever be an A player. He'll always be a C player. You might work with him and over the course of a long period of time, maybe you'll be able to have a little incremental improvement. Maybe he'll be a C plus. Maybe, 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 by the grace of God and a lot of hard sweat, he might be a B, but that's it. He'll never be an A. So remember that. You have a C player, you're stuck with a C player. But an A player, that's what you want. A guy, a man, a woman who really knows how to exceed and to turn on the fire, that has passion and really brings in the goods. But are they in the right seat? That's the question you have to, to ask. I have a little phrase that when I hire, I always hire on aptitude and I train on skills. So whenever I'm looking for someone for my team, I look at aptitudes. These are the aptitudes that this job requires, not the skill set. Skills, it's not to say skills are not important, they are important, but they are not nearly as important as aptitudes. Hire on aptitudes. I can train on skills. I cannot adjust aptitudes. Those are very, very difficult to change. People are born with aptitudes. Their aptitudes are set by the time they're seven or eight. They carry those through, through the rest of their life. So hire on aptitudes, train on skills. And then let's talk a little bit more about the crew, the right crew that shares passion, values, mission, and vision. If your crew doesn't share those things, values, vision, mission for what you're doing, I would say to you, you need a new crew. You need a new crew. Please ensure that all your candidates, which you're looking to hire, all share your vision. Passion, vision, values, those are things that don't change. You can't force people to believe in values that they don't have. It's just not gonna happen. 
So agile leaders, an agile leader, builds and shares a common understanding of purpose and values. Now, what do I mean when I say an agile leader? Well, agility is the ability of an organization to renew itself. It's the ability of a company to change quickly and to pivot and adapt and to succeed in a rapidly changing, ambiguous, and turbulent environment. Successful companies going through COVID and pandemics and storms need agility. So agility captains of their ships, agility leaders value high quality thinking. I'm gonna give you a few aptitudes of, of agility thinkers and agility leaders. They value high quality thinking. They take input from those closest to the problem, not far away consultants who don't know what the heck they're talking about, who learned everything from a book. No, if you want good input, get to the people, get to the people in your line, get to the people in your supply chain that are actually dealing with the problem. I valued very highly the opinions of my crew, of Jock. They had the experience. They were the ones that would help me. Agile leaders value high quality thinking, value the input that your team has for you. Agile leaders communicate openly and they solicit meaning, meaningful and timely feedback from peers and other team members. So communicate with your team, communicate, communicate. Strong, independent, you know, tell everybody what to do, kick them in the rear end leaders are not agile leaders. And those are not Jesus leaders. Agile leaders communicate authentically and openly. So be big on feedback from all echelons of the, uh, of the team, not just your executive members. Agile leaders respond to suggestions and are open, honest, and respectful in the communication to everybody on their team, even the guys in the lower echelons. Agile leadership is not just about driving and promoting, promoting change. I said that, you know, agility is the ability of an organization to renew itself, to adapt, and to change quickly. But it's not just about driving and promoting change. It's about being the change. And those who lead by example and actively engage in their own personal development inspire people. So be an inspiration and be the change that you're wanting to create. Agile leaders are humble, they're empathetic, they don't just preach virtues like compassion and kindness and care for their employers, they inspire, they're inspiring leaders who work on themselves first and then work on others. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also Christ Jesus, who although he was made equal to God, did not think that equality with God was something to be exploited. He was humble. He was humble. And agile leaders are humble and empathetic. They don't just live these virtues. They work on them themselves. They adopt the Jesus Messiah way of thinking. I would never have been able to captain such a fine crew through the storm if I had not yet spent years honing my own skill set and more importantly, being broken by the Holy Spirit to become a man of Jesus values. Agile leaders inspire employees to be their best selves. And they understand that emotional satisfaction is an important part of the job and of the human experience. Research has shown that innovation and creativity often spring from the recesses of emotion and joyful expectancy, not just straight line linear thought. So agile leaders collaborate with their teams. Agile leaders promote strong, powerful emotions from their team because they lead by example. And that passion finds its way into your team. Remember this, what's in you will also be in your team. Like produces like. Animals produce animals, cows produce cows, Chimpanzees produce chimpanzees, ducks produce ducks, and what's in you will be reproduced in your team. So be full of the Holy Ghost and be joyful 
and be passionate. And you will find that that passion will be a root cause for innovation. So that's enough on the team right now. I want to talk about the ship. Preparation and contingency planning for your company, particularly going through a storm, is paramount. So I'm going to give you a few tips. Identify, map, and document, and test all your systems before you get into the storm, all your processes. If you haven't done that before you get into the storm, being in the storm is not the time when you're going to test your systems and your processes. It's too late, baby. Your systems and processes will either take you to safe harbor or they will crash and burn. So things like inventory processes, manufacturing processes, customer relationship management, financial processes, selling systems. If your processes can't stand up to the rough turbulence, the hull of your company will breach and then you've got a real problem. So focus on building resiliency in your company and pay attention to those things. Create solid pathways to high value customers, not just any customers. Part of, of what we teach in uh, the Synapse Ascent program, which is in development right now, is how to focus on high value customers. Those customers which really take your revenue from 1x to 10x to 20x. And what are their pathways and how do we engage with those customers? How do you throw your customers a lifeline when they're going through the storm? Repair and strengthen those customers. Repair and strengthen your supply chain. Your supply chain is your safety harness that keeps your product flowing. Make sure your supply chain and all your vendors are strong and help them. And of course, don't forget your cash your working capital, your financials. You need four to five months in reserves minimum and four to five months in this pandemic was a drop in the bucket. I mean, it just wouldn't have been enough. But monitor, learn to monitor those three to five leading indicators that tell you how you're doing in the storm. Lagging indicators tell a story after the ship has wrecked but you need information before. So what information can you gather that tells you how you're doing? How many people, how many customers are calling? How many customers are ordering? How many people are going on and logging into your website? How many keep people are signing up for your newsletter? Whatever it is that helps you understand how, how your customers are responding to you. Focus, prepare, create contingency plans. And, um, there's a lot more which I delve into much deeper in the notes that are in the blog. So I'm going to stop there because I've bloviated long enough for an old man. But I want to say this, that during these turbulent times, the world is looking for captains of businesses who are calm, who are composed, who are trustworthy. That is definitely what your team is crying out for. They need that composure right now. Your customers need that composure and they need answers. Your team and your customers are looking for you to help calm the storms we are currently facing. And you as a kingdom entrepreneur have a new opportunity to show genuine Jesus style leadership to this broken and confused world. Now's the time to demonstrate truth, strength, and resilience in your leadership. And it's, try, and it's time to really get a hold of the nitty gritty of what you need to do to keep your business afloat. So in closing, I wanna leave you with the straightforward words of the great prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter seven, as he confronted his own storm, this is what he said. He said, take heed, be quiet, do not fear. And let, your, and let not your heart be faint. Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. Keep true to your true north, to your values. Keep on course. Collaborate with your team. Innovate, innovate, innovate like crazy on your products and services to bring to your customers the products and services they need. Learn to pivot. Trust the wisdom of your team. Trust in God and keep true to yourself. Amen. Julie, I turn it back to you. 
Wow, wow. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. And Ray is guilty of taking me from the childhood dream of a pilot. And now I'm moving into sailor. And Ray is going to take charge of this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that awesome sharing. Um, I didn't have any information about sailing, but you've just taken me across seas and oceans with that uh, experience and story. So I don't know how you guys who are on this call are feeling, but that was awesome regarding leading during storms. I feel like I need to get to that ship. So our next, uh, uh, we are running out of time. What we are going to do um, Ray, this is what has been happening. A couple of people have some questions. We are just going to give an opportunity to a few of them uh, to ask those questions. I have a couple of questions that also came through. And um, if you don't mind, I think I'll just uh, start with those ones. And then we will definitely uh, give an opportunity for uh, the people on the call to unmute and ask the questions. Please join me. Uh, with your reactions and everything, and let's show some love to the sailing class that we have been. Um, Ray, I have just, <laughs> I've just, I think, attained four miles of experience on 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 that, and I'm yet to grow my miles as well. Um, Joseph, I don't know if Joseph is there. Joseph, we have a couple of questions that came through. If you can just help me. Um, ask these questions to Ray. And then for the rest of us, please make use of the chat box. If you have a burning question, if you feel you need some sailing um, skills here, Ray is on the call. He will take you across the Atlantic. Yes, Joseph? Um, I, I think on the, um, on the chat, we, we just have general comments and uh, just uh, a summary. Thank you, Mary for helping us to summarize uh, Ray's talk uh, and, and then speech. And um, I would like just to ask, the, there was a question from Charity. Can you repeat the three to five indicators we need to focus on? And I think uh, Ray gave uh, um, a summary of it, but uh, if we don't mind, Ray, just give the, the, the key takeaways um, of, of uh, your uh, chat. You mean the, the, is she asking about like those leading indicators as you look and map out your processes to determine your progress? Was yes. that it, Charity? I think so. Okay. Charity, feel free to unmute mute and dialogue with me here. Um, yes, well, first of all, I, I think that depends on your business. I would, I would ask yourself these questions. What do I need to track? What areas do I need to track that will help me understand what my business is doing, how my business is doing before I crash on the rocks? So for example, a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs really like to look at their monthly revenue, which comes in at the end of the month. So they get their financial statements, uh, say by the 5th, 6th, or 10th of, of the next month. I hope you do the same. You need to have timely financials, QuickBook financials. It doesn't have to be a fancy um, accounting system. And you do not need an accountant, a, a full-blown accountant every month to keep track of your books. Uh, he may need to do your taxes at the end of the year. You just need some type of bookkeeper that's good. You need a good system like QuickBooks so that at the end of the month, then you can track your revenue. And revenue is a nice thing to know. It tells you how, how much you sold, but it's what we call a lagging indicator. In other words, it tells you what you did in the previous month. Well, the month is already gone, so it doesn't really help me much. Uh, it, it doesn't contribute much in making a quick decision. So, so I prefer leading indicators. Like what are the indicators that tell me that I'm on track and I'm gonna hit my sales target? Maybe it's the number of sales appointments that I have in my sales book. Okay, I normally know, I know that I close, let's say four out of 10 customers. 
when they when I engage with my customers, I close four out of ten. That's my closing ratio. So it and 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 I normally know that in in um, a week's time I engage with ten customers. So I if I'm engaging with ten customers each week, then I know that I should be hitting my closing ratio. I should be doing four. Hey, I've been engaging with ten customers every week. I'm still engaging with ten customers. I'm still on track. Now, if you get if you are uh, recording your customers that you engage with each week and that customer count falls from 10 to four, man, you've got a problem. And you know it immediately. Week one, whoa, last month I had 10 customers every week. The first week here, I've only got four. What happened? The second week, I've only got three. Oh my goodness, what's going on? I need to do something. And so immediately you're put on alert. You realize that your customers your prospects are not as strong as they have been. What do I need to do? How do I um, um, address that imbalance? So that's what you need. It's those type of indicators, those type of uh, metrics that you want to track. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And uh, I just have another question here, Ray, for you. Earlier on in your presentation, you urged us on the importance of having A players and not C players. There's a question that came in from one of the participants, uh, especially on the C players. And the question is, do the C players, are they also not created with their own gifts and capabilities? How does that reality affect how me as a business leader should engage with those employees, the C players? Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Of course they have. Everyone has been um, anointed. Everyone has been given gifts and abilities. Um, and it doesn't mean that gifts and abilities are better, that one gift or, abil or ability is better than the other. They are just different. And they are focused on different performance levels. So, uh, for example, a person who has a gift or an aptitude of real attention to detail. Uh, they have um, a gift of thoroughness and um, making sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Um, they are quiet natured. They are more introverted. Uh, they uh, don't get their energy from a crowd. They get their energy from one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations. So they are more um, um, What's the word? Um, they're more quiet, they are more reserved, they have attention to detail. A person who has those types of attitudes, I would not put him as my lead salesperson. You know, I would not put him in charge necessarily of strategy or growth initiatives, but that person might be really good at handling my uh, manufacturing processes or my supply chain, or being my accountant, or being my personal administrative assistant. They might be absolutely great at that. So I think it's important that you get people seated in the right seats. That type of individual could really excel in that, in that particular job, but they will fall flat. They will fall flat in, in a job that isn't suited for them. That's why I think it's important to hire on aptitudes and train on skills. So get the right people seated in the right seats by making sure they have the right aptitudes for the job. That's what I was referring to. Is that helpful? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. I think that has been uh, very uh, helpful. Uh, Ray, we have a couple of questions coming through here. We are running short on time, but I'll do my best to get these questions out. Uh, but before I share a question, I also want to share a compliment. Someone said, thank you for sharing your sailing experience. It's a good example of how preparation and skills can help us run successful businesses and we can survive the storms, most especially COVID-19. That was awesome. All of us have learned from the sailing experience. Yeah. There is this other question that came through and uh, someone is asking Ray that uh, earlier on again, you shared the importance of business owners and teams 
keeping an end to the goal. In your conclusion summary, you called it the true north. Would you, uh, how would you suggest leaders in businesses can achieve this during COVID-19 crisis, which is so uncertain? How do we keep to the true north? Right. Well, that's a, a, a good question. And if you read my notes in the blog on the Sanapis site, uh, I, I use this term true north and true north represents the values, um, those leadership qualities uh, that that are so very, very important to us. Uh, care. I talk about care um, and also challenge in that paper. So I would refer you to that. I think um, I think. Um, keeping to your true north, uh, values-led leadership is what's needed. And I think leaders should, should lead from their values. Um, and it's not a question of either or. It's not a question of, of, you know, pushing and pushing for high performance and neglecting your values. It's, it's both together. It's, um, it's not a balance between the two. It's sort of like giving the team what they need at the moment. So values are things that drive us. Uh, values, I think, are very important. Uh, that's why, I, for me, when I look at hiring a team, I want to hire team members that at the very get-go, at the outset, have the same values that I do. And then I think as I, as a leader, live out those values, and we as a team live out those values. They become a part of us. We adopt what Paul was saying, the Messiah way of thinking. And the Messiah way of thinking leads to a Messiah way of living. A values way of thinking leads to a values way of living. So I think it's just as we as authentic leaders, as we as leaders of, uh, with agility, agile leaders, embrace and love on our teams, and we live out our values that inspires them to, to, to do the same. Did I answer that question, Julie? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Ray. Um, that was awesome. Like I said, the questions are quite enormous. Maybe what we shall do, some of these questions are going to make their way to the Almunai socials, our pages. Ray is still here with us. Um, he'll make every effort to share some of those questions. But overall, Ray, I'm, I'm not sure if you're having a look at the chat box. It's just thumbs up for you, five ratings and all those other things uh, regarding your presentation. Thank you so much for sharing with us that um, story. It was a story of vulnerability, but also learning. And uh, I'm glad that uh, we have picked the right lessons for us to sell our businesses on the other side of the harbor. I'm handing over to Joseph right now, who is going to give us the next line of action on this particular ship as we get to the other side. Joseph, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Ray. Um, this has really been a great experience for me. Um, I wanted to be a pilot when I was growing up. Uh, I think just coming from the village, uh, we used to see planes go up. Uh, but right now, I think I want to be a sailor, uh, not because of anything else, but there are great lessons that are really gleaned from uh, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those who are really excited about this session, and thank you for the five-star rating, we would like to request you to just join one of the Synapse uh, alumni groups, uh, which are online, so that you don't miss any uh, such opportunities. And uh, my colleague, Julie, will be sharing the links uh, uh, shortly. Um, um, on that, on, on those groups, we are going to share the link to the blog. Um, I wanted just to read for you something also that Ray had written in, in the that will be in the blog that difficult difficulties mastered are opportunities won, and it uh, it is a quote by Winston Churchill. So uh, you watch uh, the the um, the groups uh, kindly join the groups so that uh, you're able to read the whole blog. I also shared on the chat. Uh, where the blog will be. And uh, for the recording, Lynn, um, the recording will be also on the uh, alumni groups. I just wanted to give a quick uh, alumni update. 
uh, we'll have, uh, I've just shared my screen. We are going to continue these sessions and save the date uh, on the 19th of August. Again, we're going to have an East Africa event uh, time, the same time from Rwanda, it is 3 to 5 p.m. From uh, East Kenya and Uganda, it will be 4 to 6 p.m. We'll have another speaker. Uh, who will be sharing with us. Um, uh, quickly, we also have a digital directory that we are putting together. If you're interested, kindly just uh, uh, reach out to us uh, through the emails that you saw when you're registering, alumni at synapse.org, then we'll, we'll feature your business uh, in the uh, directory. We also have an opportunity for you to be spotlighted uh, uh, within the alumni network, so kindly if you're interested, again, just uh, chat us. You can even leave a chat here, give us your email. We'll reach out to you uh, from uh, the East African uh, community. Uh, also, we have uh, the online uh, platform that Julie has shared the links uh, as you give us feedback also. And then for those from Kenya, uh, we have the coaching uh, program, uh, which also will be scaled later uh, to other countries. So this Synapse Group Coaching Program, we have a masterclass uh, uh, happening uh, next week. And this is the flyer. Synapse Coaching unlocks your potential and people and propels you to the next level of leadership. Alongside a small group, uh, professional, uh, professionally driven peers who know what you're experiencing. So this session will be on uh, Wednesday 30th uh, from 5.30 to 7.00. Uh, it will be via Zoom, so uh, we'll share the same info if uh, any of you is interested from Kenya. Um, uh, for those in Kenya, again, we have a project we are running called Haventure. Uh, for the ladies, this is only for the ladies, kindly. Men, um, you can share with your sisters, your wives, uh, uh, your nieces. Um, it's just a simple uh, app that you download. Uh, it is supporting women entrepreneurs uh, by equipping them with business skills. And uh, all that, I want to say have a great evening, but before you leave, I would like to request one of us to just pray for us as we started with prayer. Uh, we want also to end with prayer. Um, who is bold enough, kindly, to just pray for us as we leave? I would I love to pray, pray for this group. Could I, could I pray for this group? Yes, Ray, thank you so much, Ray. All right. I hope that's okay. Thank you for the privilege of, of, of praying. Let's pray together. Father, <clears throat> we come to you today as, as quite an eclectic group of entrepreneurs, each one of us on a different voyage. We are in a ship sailing similar, but nevertheless quite different courses. But we all have one destination in mind, and that is to bring you glory through our business. We want to be captains of a ship that really is the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in and through us and in, our, in and through our teams and in, our, in and through our companies. Father, we thank you for this great high and mighty calling that we have on our lives. We thank you, Father, that you have apprehended us for this incredible vocation of being an entrepreneur, of taking the risk to create wealth and create good paying jobs, to bring social impact and spiritual impact, and to be a cultural mover and shaker in our spheres of influence. Father God, that's who we are. Our identity is in you. We are you your servants. We are your slaves. We are your vice regents. And we are here to represent you through our business to the public sphere. So Father, we ask, we desperately need you, and we ask for the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us, energize us, renew our thinking, change us, develop within us a Messiah way of thinking about life, about people, about teams, about business, about how to turn a profit, about how to innovate on an idea, about how to love on and care for our customers and our vendors and our team, our employees, our city, which we live. 
So, Father, I ask now, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah King, that you would reach out and bless each and every one of these founders. I pray for your blessing. I pray that you keep, keep them safe during this COVID pandemic, that you keep them and their loved ones from harm. But Father, in the event that COVID does come, we trust in you and your provision and your spirit, for we are yours. Father, I pray for the anointing of your spirit. I pray for your provision as each one of these entrepreneurs face difficult times. Father God, they need capital. They need cash in the bank. They need ideas as to how to regain lost sales. Some of them will not make it. They will capsize. Some have already capsized. And they are not even here on the call. Father, we pray for them as well. Our heart aches for those brothers and sisters. And yet, Lord Jesus, we also believe for better times. We trust for better times. We trust for a better economy. Lord Jesus, you know what you're doing. You are at the helm of our ship. We're the captain, but we're really just the co-captain. You're the captain. At our boardroom, you are truly the chairman. We are your servants. So, Father, deal with us in our business. Use us for your glory. I commit these wonderful entrepreneurs to you. Bless them in their going in and their coming out. Bless them in their lying down and their waking up. Bless them in every aspect of their life. May they experience shalom, true flourishing of your spirit, of provision, of power, of might, of knowledge. Give them all the resources that they need so that they might achieve your destiny. I pray for them. And Father, I believe that you will be with them. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah King, the true ruler of this world, the King of kings and Lord of lords, we wrap ourselves in his, in his royalty. We wrap ourselves in his throne. We wrap ourselves in, in his authority. And we wrap ourselves in our love and care for our teams and for one another. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.